I want to talk about this documentary, specifically Take Care of Maya. So in brief, this little girl, Maya, she has some sort of pain syndrome, and mom's like, oh no, what's wrong with her? And they go to different doctors, and they can't really explain a lot of it, and she, mom, pushes for this ketamine treatment from a doctor. It's a medically-induced coma, and I, I'll stop right here for a second, because when I, I hate judging a book by its cover. It's not fair. But that doctor gave off a major quack vibe to me, even on Netflix. Yeah, we can and talk about him. You feel strongly about that, I feel like, maybe? Is there a little? Well, that was quite yes, the inhale. We'll, well, yeah, sorry. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get to Mr. We'll, we'll get okay. to Dr. Kirkpatrick. Yes. So, so the, the child gets taken away, and then people are like, Jordan, you've got to see this. You have no idea how easy it is for you to get your kids taken away when you take them to the hospital, which is ultimately... A, a massive amount of damage that people are that, that is being done by a documentary like this. I take it you're not a fan of the documentary. Uh, I would imagine this is doing harm to reporting because somebody's like, I don't want my kids taken away from me, so I'm not going to take my kid to the hospital until it's really, 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 really bad. Or I shouldn't report this because I don't want something to happen to my sister because they'll just take kids away willy nilly. And it's in the documentary, they're not very specific, right? How this happens. They say like CPS or the hospital, they took the kids away. That's not what happens. Um, CPS doesn't remove kids, judges remove kids, and they do that based on evidence that they see in their courtroom. So it's from what I understand, it's not easy to just lose your kids. It's not some random horror story. There's a preponderance of the evidence. You need evidence, even a psychological evaluation that says, oh, I didn't find the mother credible. You still need evidence that this is going on. You can't, you don't just show up at the hospital for an asthma attack and they're like, you're not getting your kids back. Sorry, that's just not real. No, it, it it's absolutely not real. And yes, I, I have watched the film. I was familiar with the story before it was covered by that documentary because there was a big piece in New York Magazine about the, um, about the case, which was, I will say, more responsible than the film, um, not altogether responsible, in my opinion. But yes, I mean, so to talk about kind of, we can talk about what what happens and sort of like debunk some of these things. And then I think, um, and then, yeah, really talk about, I really want to get into why, why these narratives are so damaging, because some of the reasons that you mentioned, um, and why I think people need to recognize that this is putting other children at very real risk and very real harm. And that, you know, I mean, I, Detective Mike, when we were talking about this movie on my show, I mean, he said, basically, in no uncertain terms, this pendulum will swing back once a bunch of children die. And that is, I don't think he's overstating that. So yes, so the story of Maya Kowalski, um, so there's the story that that the movie tells. And the, the movie is leaning very strongly into this narrative that Beata Kowalski, this mother, you know, and, and her husband, Jack, who is a big part of the documentary, and it should be noted, is currently suing Johns Hopkins for $220 million um, for false accusation and false imprisonment. So we can get to those. And actually, I would love your lawyerly take on some of that. But um, so the, the, this lawsuit is coming up this fall. And so this documentary came out a couple of months ago, and it really leans hard into a telling of this case that paints Beata Kowalski, the mom in question, as innocent and blames the hospital directly for her death. Beata Kowalski died by suicide about two and a half months into the investigation into her. So about two and a half months after her daughter was put in shelter care. And so there is the story the film puts forth, and they leave it to, I mean, right away, I was concerned when they left it to the defense attorney of Jack Kowalski to explain what Munchausen by proxy or medical child abuse was. She framed it very much to my mind of, she said, there is this new diagnosis that they can just give any parent that brings in a sick child. And I was like, number one, it's not new. Number one, <laughs> it's absolutely false. And she said, you know, and she really frames it that like this is any 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 parent with a sick child is is at risk of this. And I think that is a horrible thing to put in parents' heads, because if you don't want to make 
parents with legitimately sick children afraid to take them to the doctor. I mean, that's horrible. And I get messages like that from people. Oh, my God, should I be scared to take is this? Is this really like this over, you know, this epidemic of false ap- accusations? And so, um, you know, and so she she really frames this as, um, you know, and obviously she has, I think people should be very aware. And I, I'm not saying this is the entire reason that he's doing this or that, you know, someone shouldn't be allowed to seek remuneration if they feel they've been harmed. But that $220 million lawsuit is not a small amount of money. And you are, you know, the the people driving the narrative are Jack Kowalski and his attorney in this in the film. They get a lot of screen time, including Dr. Kirkpatrick. So the story of Maya that's told in the film is that they brought her into the hospital to Johns Hopkins for stomach pain and that she also had this underlying condition called chronic regional pain syndrome, um, which is which is a, a real condition um, and can be intensely painful. And and that this series of events at the hospital, which they give very little detail on in the film, um, you know, led to her being removed from her parents' custody and put in shelter care in the hospital where she, you know, spent the next couple of months. Right. And, and, and this is what people so, are saying is so terrible, right? They wouldn't let Beata, the mother, see or hug Maya right. at all. Right. It seems very cruel. The documentary hammers that home. There's a social yes. worker that's on the phone call because they don't want the mother to be like, so how is your medical thing going? And they're worried that right. she, right, they're, I guess rightfully, in your opinion, worried that she's going to do something to influence the daughter's behavior because one of the sort of tells was that the child, Maya, her behavior around the illness was different when her mother was there. And everybody, she played it up to what mom wanted. She was different otherwise. The hospital staff, doctors, everybody noticed this. And then they were like, no contact with mom. And then she's sort of changing and but the documentary is like they just took it away and you wouldn't let the mom right. say anything and sort that's why she killed no herself reason. right yeah and i mean they really they really pull no punches but with making that connection i mean the i think it's the defense attorney who's the talking head when she says this is oh that her not giving that or the judge not letting her hug maya that's what killed her right I remember um, which that. is you know just i think that's a pretty irresponsible way to talk about suicide bit, but that that completely aside you know that is what he's trying to sue them for right he's trying to sort of sue them for the the, the pain and harm caused by Beata's death so yeah I mean I think one of the biggest things is this sort of question about the shelter order and the no contact order and you know there's some differing opinions on it I will say in the APSAC guidelines which that's the umbrella organization that I'm part of this committee the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children um, the Munchausen by Proxy Committee has a set of guidelines lines that um, for professionals and and I believe the actual pro- you know recommendation is to have supervised visitation but that said and I, we don't know and I mean I think the, the really important thing to underscore with this film and with any conversation about this case is that there's so much that we don't know because the criminal investigation was halfway through when Beata died and they didn't continue it once she had died. And so there is a lot that we will never know about this case that is sort of unlikely to come to light. Um, but, you know, what we don't know is if there was other things that Beata was doing that made them issue a no contact order, because certainly we've seen these kind of things and the, the psychological, you know, if if it was indeed a, a case of an offender, you know, offenders are so psychologically manipulating that they can really impede their child's progress if they're allowed to see them and that that that's part of what they're trying to separate the child from. So I agree that the, you know, the separation order with no supervised visitation, that does seem draconian. What I think we need to keep an open mind about is that there may have been a reason for it that we wouldn't know, right? Because that's the thing that would be in like CPS paperwork that's not going to be available to the public. So the big question, you know, the big point that this film makes, I mean, they perpetuate a bunch of the most common misperceptions about medical child abuse. Number one, um, now I will say, again, so I think that it's, it's important to establish what we're not going to be able to know. We're not going to be able to know for sure whether Beata was guilty or not. But I don't think it's appropriate to present her as as innocent when you don't know, um, when you don't have that information on hand. And we're not going to know whether or not Maya really has CRPS because I don't have her medical records, obviously. Um, there were certainly some doctors that felt that she did. And there were a lot of doctors that provided affidavits that did not feel that she did. Certainly, I know from having spoken to a doctor at length about this yesterday, 
that her presentation of it was very atypical. CRPS, in my understanding, is something that usually comes along after an injury. So basically, you know, you break your wrist and then some percentage of the population will develop this, you know, really debilitating pain condition as a result of that. Maya's allegedly took place um, or the onset of Maya's was allegedly because of um, was because of an asthma attack, which is, again, extremely atypical um, and was presenting as an all over body thing. So there are cases of CRPS that have sort of escalated to being all over body things from my understanding. And again, obviously not a doctor, not an expert, but this is from what I know about it, but certainly atypical. And it's pretty rare in children. And the prognosis for children versus CRPS in adults is actually um, extremely good. And so I think that's important to keep in mind because what the film leaves out, they do talk about the ketamine treatments. They put Dr. Kirkpatrick, more about him in a bit, um, on screen. You know, he's the only doctor that's sort of there as a talking head. They they play a little bit of testimony from from the other doctors. Right, the other doctors um, are at depositions being like, we thought she was right. abusing her daughter. And they're like, dun, 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 this guy's in right, the conspiracy. Right. And, and sort of this thing of like, they don't explain why those things happened and my immediate reaction upon watching this film is like, okay, all right, I want to get to the bottom of like what there is. What else can I find out about this case? And indeed, I found a lot. So I think, um, yeah, they sort of presented as this doctor just decided that this child was an abuse victim and went after it in a way where she was trying to prove it. You know, even the New York Magazine piece, the title of it was, A Doctor Thought It Was Medical Abuse, How Far Would She Go to Prove It? And I was like, what kind of question is that? If it's true, then probably pretty far because she's trying to save a child's life. Anyway, um, so they're obviously framing it as like, this is just this one, you know, bad actor, this one bad doctor. And so, in fact, you know, this history of, of Maya Kowalski's treatment for CRPS, when you look at it, is jaw dropping. So she was the alleged onset was in July of 20. So one of the things they really obscure in the film is the timeline of events, which is extremely important um, because something like ketamine treatment, even at a much smaller dose, which Maya was receiving a massive dose of ketamine. There are affidavits from pediatric pain specialists who said they've never seen anyone on that level of ketamine. Um, so, you know, something like ketamine or really any opioid for a pain disorder is something that's seen as a last result, right? Because these things can ha have a lot of damage. They can do liver damage. They can do brain damage. They can cause a child to go into respiratory failure. I mean, there are very, very serious consequences to a drug like that, especially when given in really large amounts. Obviously, this is also ketamine is also a street drug. Um, so it's a dangerous drug to be on, especially if you are a child. And so I think the timeline is really important and it's very obscured. So the timeline of this is that the alleged onset was in July of 2015. Um, they did take her to an inpatient um, sort of you know, the, the regular standard of treatment for something like CRPS is to start with, you know, these lower level medications like Tylenol and then do physical therapy and occupational therapy. So they did do, it appears, some of that. And they had her in this month long inpatient person. And that was actually one of the previous reports to CPS that this this rehabilitation nurse thought something was going on and she reported them to CPS. So that was that was one of the other reports that happened in that summer of 2015. Um, so after that, it was in, so the onset was in July. By September, Beata and Maya were in Dr. Kirkpatrick's office and he diagnosed her with CRPS. And then by October, they were doing these four-day ketamine infusions in his office. So in that short of a period of time to escalate to the most extreme possible thing that you can do, that is alarming. Um, and then, you know, between then and the uh, the Johns Hopkins hospitalization, you know, was when she went to Mexico and was put in a five-day coma. Crazy. Um, Obviously, that is a life-threatening thing. And CRPS is not a disease that can be fatal. It is a thing that is very serious. You know, they mention in the film that it's known as the suicide disease. There is, you know, a high rate risk of suicide because, you know, it is, it's kind of, these chronic pain conditions are obviously awful. Um, but... You know, according to the doctor that I spoke to, when people die who have CRPS, it's either because of some bad mixing of medication that they're taking or because they commit suicide, which is very sad. But it's not something that can be fatal. And so one of the other things that stuck out to me looking at this is Beata was pushing to get Maya labeled as terminal. 
And there's an exchange between her and Dr. Kirkpatrick where he says that that's not in the scope of his practice, but he he encourages her to reach out to hospice care. And this stuck out to me because one of the things that's in the film that struck me, and I wonder if this sounded equally as strange to you, is that Dr. Kirkpatrick himself recounts sending this note to the to Beata and to the doctors that if Maya is not given the ketamine treatment that Beata is demanding she be given, that she will die a slow and painful death. Which which doesn't make sense if it's non fatal. Is he just implying that she'll eventually take her own life, which is also like kind of a stretch for a doctor it's a weird claim for a doctor to make. It's a very strange thing to say, and it doesn't medically make any sense. I mean, it, what it sounds like he's implying is that if she doesn't get this treatment, she's going to wither away and die from this disease. So that really struck me as as very odd, and um, that made him pretty questionable. And there's lots of other reasons he's Yeah, there's lots but... of other we, we don't have sort of the bandwidth to get into all <laughs> yes. of that stuff. I mean, which... the, the short version is he runs an all-cash practice where this is the only thing that he does. And, you know, I think, like, he's – this is – ketamine treatments, especially for children, are way, way outside the standard, you know, of practice for, you know, standard of care for this, this treatment. So that's enough said about him. Um, but I think, you know, when it came to that hospitalization and – Again, people need to remember that doctors' jobs, they are required by law to report suspicions of abuse. They are not required to provide a complete investigation, you know, and a smoking gun, right? And they need to. We want them to do that. We do not want doctors to be in a position where they're not reporting abuse. So multiple doctors had heard, you know, were noticing these strange things. You know, they sort of in the film characterized Beata's behavior as being pushy and sort of overbearing. But it was much more serious than that. You know, she was interfering with their ability to take vitals. She was making all of these comments, you know, she was put what she was pushing for was that she was demanding that they put her daughter in a ketamine coma in the hospital. Now, this is something that she had to be sent outside of the country to do, right? So, yeah, obviously that's, this hospital is I, not I noticed going to that too. That. Like, you're arguing yeah. with jo- one of the finest hospitals in the United States to do this, and they're like, no. And then she's like, fine, I'm gonna go to this random place in Tijuana in that case. It's like, right, wait right. a second, right? I mean, that that's it's. It's strange behavior. And so she, you know, during this hospitalization that led to the shelter order, she was demanding that they give her an infusion pump, which is what you do when you're putting someone in a, in a coma and, and give her, put her in a ketamine coma and said she needs this. And she made many comments, you know, back to this thing about her wanting to, Maya to be labeled as terminal. She made many comments about Maya's mortality. And this is in front of her daughter. And she said, you know, Maya is in so much pain. She just wants to go to heaven. Um, and she said, she, you know, if you're not going to give her the pain medication, then I might as well just try and go get enough from hospice care so that she can finally die because oh she doesn't gosh. live this way anymore. That's a humongous and, red flag. If you don't do right. this, I and might just kill my daughter. It's not a good. It's not how you handle. Yeah, something and I like mean, this. again, this is not a fatal disease, and this is a ten-year-old child who is a year and change out from a diagnosis. It's not a child that has terminal cancer that is in excruciating pain that is going to die no matter what. You know. That is not what's on the table. This is not an elderly person, you know, who's who's in horrible pain. I mean, it's just the idea as a parent of talking about your child like that. And the reason that especially that talk about hospice came up, you know, really came up for me is because that is something that has come up in a bunch of known cases. So one of the, um, you know, Hope Yabara made comments about how her daughter, because she was pretending she was also going to die, about how her daughter would soon join her in heaven. Um, you know, the Denise attack case, which is another case out of Texas that Mike Weber was involved in. Um, she had purchased a coffin for her son. She was trying to get him admitted to hospice care. Fortunately, he was removed from her, and I believe she did some prison time, and that young man went on to live a healthy life and played college football. Um, I mean, there's, there's numerous other cases. The one that haunts me the most is the case of Olivia Gant, which is a story of a little girl, a six-year-old girl in Colorado whose mother was, um, you know, it was, again, it was one of the progression of the feeding issues that I was talking about, and her mother was allowed to take her and put her in home hospice and um, she died there and 
the hospital had suspicions that these issues were not real and that the mother was fabricating and they did not report. And her mother was not investigated for her death until she tried to bring another child of hers in for cancer treatment that they did not need. And then they went back and investigated this death. And in that case, the grandparents sued the hospital for not reporting. So, you know, the consequences of doctors not reporting, that is the consequences of doctors not reporting that you have a possible ch a child that could die. And if a mother is talking about hospice, when there is no, you know, reason that she should be talking about hospice, that is extremely terrifying. And so the idea that a judge issued a shelter order and separated them under those circumstances, I don't see where that could be construed as the wrong decision. Um, and obviously, much of that is left out of the film, right? All of those yeah. things are left well, out yeah. of the Well, yeah, the film. narrative it's is really so clear. really painted as an innocent, yeah. It's really, like, supposed to, this film should scare you into never going to, right. I mean, that's really what the whole thing seems like. But, I, okay, look, I'd have to guess, outside of the film, I'd have to guess that most kids subjected to this type of abuse, if they don't die from it, don't they all eventually grow up and figure out that this is not real? I mean, aren't you, when you're 16 or 18 or even younger, aren't you, like, but I'm not paralyzed, right? Don't we all become Gypsy Rose who's like, but you're making me sick, but I'm not, I don't have pain throughout all my extremities. I can walk. Yeah. This is weird. You're doing something to me. Like, doesn't, isn't the jig almost always up at some point for the parents? Well, you would, you would think so. Um, unfortunately, you know, as we talked about the psychological component of this, and it's, you know, despite what this film would have you believe, it is actually very rare that these children are separated from their abusers, even when the abuse is very severe. Most of the time, family courts, you know, and, and CPS too, I mean, the family reunification is, is the mandate, right? And so most courts are not knowledgeable about this form of abuse and and do not take it as seriously as they ought to. And so most of the survivors I've spoken to were it may be separated from their parent for a couple of years at most, but were ultimately raised by, by their abuser. And I think, you know, the effects of being told you're sick your entire life are so profound. And um, they, you know, for instance, Jordan, who is a survivor that that I work with, and they were they've been on the show a couple of times, you know, they are in their late 20s. And they believed until about two months ago that they had asthma, because they were told wow. their whole life they had asthma. And there is this, you know, there are these elements of like, it just your your body can have physical responses if you think you're sick. I mean, the, the brain body connection is very complex. And so what I've mostly found is that actually, people are more likely to be, you know, further along, like in their 20s, when they really realize that they, they what's happened to them, because they have to get some space from that parent, you know, they have to go off to college or move to another state or, you know, really get some outside perspective. And then they suddenly realize, oh, wait, this doesn't add up. And then they go back and look at their medical records. And oftentimes they see doctors charting suspicions of, you know, Munchausen by proxy or sort of people having made reports or, or just all of these things that don't add up. And so that obviously is then, then it's then it's just a, a horrible realization to come to that this person that a lot of times they're still really attached to and they still really love has completely betrayed them and, you know, subjected them to this horrible abuse. So and there are survivors who never come out of it, who just stay in the sort of delusion. Um, there's a famous case of this girl, Jennifer Bush, another case out of Florida, where um, the mom was convicted and, and spent some time in prison for abuse. And the evidence was very clear. And she, Jennifer Bush, was put in the foster care system. And when she turned, she had a horrible experience in the foster care system, which is really sad. And when she turned 18, she reunited with her mother. And she basically says, this never happened. It didn't, I mean, it, it the evidence is there, but she sort of says this never happened. My mom was falsely accused, and now she's speaking out against it. So, I mean, it's it's really really complex because of the level. I mean, there is no there is no easier person on earth to manipulate than your own child, right? I mean, the the psychological power you have over your own children is just profound. 